We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, many of us recognize these words. They were written by Thomas Jefferson, a slave owner. And yet our nation's history has not put these words into action. It took over a hundred years for women to get the right to vote. And many decades after that, for black people to get the legal right to vote. And it was not until 1968 that housing segregation was made illegal and is in law, if not today, in practice. So the differences that divide white people and people of color in this country's history and present day experience are important to understand and appreciate if we are going to build a world of justice and equal opportunity. So what is our responsibility now to deal with that history? That is some of what we're going to be discussing tonight. We will hold a conversation across race and across generations. And my name is Michael Jacoby Brown. I live here in Arlington, where I've lived for many years with my wife and my daughter. And here is Alensa Michelle, and she can introduce herself. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. My name is uh, Lenta Michelle, and I am a community organizer, and I live in Boston. Yeah. And my name, again, is Michael Jacoby Brown. I live here in Arlington, and I'm also a community organizer. And uh, I was born in 1947. And in 1950, my dad, a World War II vet, was able to buy a little tract house in Long Island, just outside New York City, where he had grown up. And at that time, Alensa's family, being dark-skinned, was not able, would not have been able, because they were black, to buy that same house. Now, I was only three years old, so I didn't really know that, but I did know that all my neighbors were white. The elementary school I went to was all white. The high school I went to was all white. It was actually divided into white folks, but the white folks were either Jewish, like me, or Catholic and Italian, and there were some Irish people. There were no Protestants. Uh, so that was a lot of my experience growing up, and it wasn't until I came to Boston about 40 years ago that I started learning about race and meeting on a regular basis and working with people of color. And so I'd like to contrast that with Alensa's experience growing up. Uh, she was born a lot later than 1947. Thanks for that. Um, so I, I was born in the 80s, and uh, my family, like many um, Im immigrants, um, uh, particularly of Caribbean background, they had came to they had came to Boston um, as part of sort of a wave of of uh, Caribbean immigrants that were coming in between the late 60s through the mid 80s, um, where there was a big influx at the time, and it was hard for them when they first got here because um, both of my parents are highly educated individuals. My father was a chemist, uh, my mother uh, was a school teacher, and they both had difficulty finding jobs in, in their background simply because they were um, of a, um, from a foreign country. Um, their, their degrees and their credits were not being recognized by the uh, United States government. And so my mother ended up working as a store clerk, and my father worked at a shelter um, as the um, stocking shelves. And so they, I was born um, soon after they arrived, um, and so it was myself, my older sister, and my parents, and we were struggling to get by living in Mattapan, which uh, has a lot of um, negative stigma to it. Um, but 
in my experience as a child growing up in the community, we felt very protected and very um, supported mm -hmm. by our neighbors um, in ways that I haven't experienced in um, into my adulthood, in places I've lived in since. Um, but we also didn't have a lot of means. We um, we grew, we were you grew up on low income, and Mattapan was basically the only place in Boston that we could afford. And so mm -hmm. that's really how sort of the influx mm -hmm. of um, you know, Haitian, Jamaican, Trinidadian immigrants that, that kind of clustered in that place uh, gathered mostly out of necessity as opposed to um, <laughs> out of uh, a, a particular desire to be there. And I think that's, a, that's an important distinction to be made when we talk about um, immigrant migrations. Like immigrants don't, uh, folks who, who, are, who emigrate into the United States don't come um, solely because they want to start these ethnic enclaves. They're forced into it mm -hmm. uh, because resources are limited and um, <clears throat> they end up becoming, uh, end up being uh, forced together um, and rely on each other in ways that they could not rely on existing government systems to support them. Mm -hmm. I mean, and just across generations, there's a huge difference. I mean, mm -hmm. one, uh, my parents haven't, they were both born in about 1920, my dad in 1920 in Budapest, Hungary, my mom in 1921 in New York City. Mm -hmm. And being white, we're able to buy that little house in 1950 for about $16,000. Mm -hmm. And being of my generation, I was able to go to college. Um, I went to Columbia College in the city of New York mm -hmm. starting in 1965. The tuition was $1,800. Mm -hmm. And my dad was working as a commercial artist. I don't think he made a lot of money. Maybe he made $10,000. So the annual tuition, and I took out a loan and got a job, was about one-fifth of his income. Wow. Now that tuition today, my guess is probably closer to sixty thousand mm -hmm, dollars. Mm -hmm. So to have that, you can check me on the math. You'd mm -hmm. have to make about three hundred thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. for the tuition to be one fifth of your income. So I came out of college with about, I think it was something like five thousand dollars in loans, mm -hmm. which I was able to pay off fairly quickly. I worked as a high school teacher for a couple years. They knocked off 10% mm -hmm. for those two years and the rest I paid off pretty quickly. Now people of your generation have a very different experience. Yeah. Uh, when I was coming up, we really didn't worry about getting a job and mm -hmm. I, I didn't think about it and I didn't realize how lucky I was. And the experience of people born in 1980 or after is really different. I don't know yeah. if you could Tell me a little bit more about that and what your experience was like. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I think uh, particularly when it comes to education at attainment uh, and the, the, the difficulty um, of being able to afford college uh, nowadays, uh, it really is a lot of crippling debt and it adds to a whole series of other areas of debt that I think young people are, are forced with uh, today that uh, isn't really talked about um, and I think that also fuels a lot of the behaviors and I think a lot of the division across the generations because you know um, I'm not a millennial I, I'd consider myself more of a generation X which is sort of folks born in late 70s to early 80s um, but uh, those who were born shortly after me they're really struggling um, mm -hmm. And I'd say I struggle too, uh, but I definitely think it's it's gotten even worse for those who've come uh, who were born after me, uh, largely because inflation rates are much higher now. Um, everything is based on a credit system, more far more than it was before. I mean, even you know, uh, if we were to think in the past, when there were there were programs like the Works Progress Administration program, which was established after. Uh, the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of incentives mm -hmm. and ways that helped, you know, Americans get back on their feet and get back mm -hmm. into the workforce. You know, we just had a recession in 2008, and there were none of those kinds of programs that were made mm -hmm. available to folks who were losing their homes to foreclosure, uh, people who were losing their jobs, who were being laid off. I know tons of nonprofit organizations, for example, that were closed around that period of time because a lot mm -hmm. of the 
uh, private investor funding that, were, that they were getting that was sort of being translated into donor funds, they, they lost that ability. Um, mm -hmm. And there was no kind of institutional support for, for folks going through that. And so now folks are coming out of it with a broader sense of fear and anxiety, and I would even argue a little bit of resentment um, that you know, young people just aren't being supported the way mm -hmm. um, we had the, the promise of of America, mm -hmm. sort of the, the sense of prosperity seems to be only limited to a certain group, and that's only exacerbated by you know race and class uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't know this, of course, in 1950 that your family couldn't move to the suburbs, sure. but that was federal policy. Mm -hmm. uh, I show this video. Uh, uh, part of uh, a three-part series called Race, the Power of an Illusion to a lot of white people. The second part's called The House We Live In. Mm -hmm. uh, the House We Live In. And it shows that it was federal policy in writing yep. that black folks were not to be given yep. mortgages or even white folks weren't, or no one was be able to uh, get a mortgage yep. from the federal government, from the federal housing authority, if there are any black people living in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So white folks, like my family, were able to build up some assets because those homes in the suburbs in the 50s and 60s right. uh, appreciated in value. Mm -hmm. But black folks were stuck in the cities not being able to move into the huge suburbs that were being built yep. all around those cities in the 50s and 60s. Yep. So the rents were higher. They weren't able to build any assets. So that history is still with us today. Absolutely. So the uh, average asset, mm -hmm. I think, of an African American family in Boston is something like eight dollars. Yep. The average assets. According to the Federal Reserve report. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The average assets of the average white family is something like 150 or 250. 247 thousand. Thousand. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a huge difference, and that is basically based mm -hmm. on the racist covenants that was set up you know, 50 and 60 years ago. Yep. Uh, and I think a, I showed this video to mm -hmm. my Jewish congregation, 35 very well-educated white people, and I said, mm -hmm. how many of you know this? Raise your hand. I don't think a hand went up. Mm -hmm. We don't mm -hmm. teach this in school. Mm -hmm. So a lot of white people just don't understand the history and assume that Everybody could make it if they try hard, mm -hmm. and it's your own fault if you are not, you know, middle class that you didn't try hard. Right. But what I've learned, I mean, just coming to Boston, the difference is certainly in the the schools. Yes. Uh, where most black folks are forced to live and have been for 50, 60 years in the cities in Boston, mm -hmm. like you. Mm -hmm. Those schools are so different from mm -hmm. the schools in the suburbs. I tell That's this story, true. and you've yeah. heard this more times than I care to repeat, and I tell this to every white person I know. I was checking for a friend of mine uh, who was running for city council in Boston mm -hmm. at the Higginson Lewis Middle School in Boston. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't been there before. It was in November. It was a cold day. And the kids were all, first of all, running around in the gym where I was sitting down <clears throat> with their coats on because the heat yep. was controlled by downtown Boston. Yep. The room was freezing. And then I tell everyone I know, well, I had to go to the bathroom to urinate. And I walked into the bathroom, and there's the toilet sitting on a piece of wood or a couple pieces of wood with huge gaps mm -hmm. in between the wood so I could see the dirt, mm -hmm. the ground, the earth, yep. right beneath that. Now, what does that say? to our children about their worth, what we care about them. Right. And that kind of, those bathrooms yep. have been like that for over 40 years. I've been in a lot of those. Yep. And unfortunately, uh, most white folks uh, experience what my uh, teacher and mentor, Valerie Batts, who founded, one of the founders of Visioning, calls the avoidance of contact. Because most white people, not that they wake up in the morning and say, hmm, how am I going to avoid meeting any folks of color? It's just the way the world is set up. They live in Wayland, they live in Brookline yeah. or Newton, yep. and they work on 128 or they work downtown. And their world doesn't include people that look like you, by mm -hmm, and large. Mm -hmm. And they have never been to any of those Boston public schools. Right. It's just, it's not on their running route. 
And because of that avoidance of contact, uh, those conditions, I think, are easier to perpetuate. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I would even say they, they definitely perpetuate even today. I mean, when I was in high school, I attended a Boston public school. And we used to joke, my peers and I would joke that it, it was, a, we would call it the welfare school because we had no doors on our bathroom stalls. Mm -hmm. And so we would have to like basically maneuver with one, one another whenever we had to use the restroom. And it went on like this for, for a few years before they finally had the stalls, um, uh, you know, the doors um, uh, reinstated, so to speak. Um, and even on, uh, you know, going back to your point about housing, the, on the housing front, while there isn't an um, overt form of redlining and segregation anymore, banks still continue to do practices where they don't um, uh, give out mortgages um, to certain uh, people of color from certain communities, or they give them out mortgages at much higher premium rates. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also seen a lot of uh, examples of people who want to start a small business um, are forced to like show an extensive amount of years of, of work as if to prove that they have the capacity to pay mm -hmm. off their, their, their loans. Um, and then they're being denied loans to even start small businesses. So. And, and this is a, a huge impact on uh, communities of color, particularly communities who have that, that have been historically marginalized. And it's it is a it is an interesting thing when we think about this idea of avoidance of contact because the avoidance of contact means the inability to learn and grow and change. Right. Mm -hmm. I recently went to a dinner party in Cambridge, mm. and um, you know I was invited by you know a really wonderful family you know, folks who identif identify themselves as progressives. Um, and one of the uh, women that was there was, was sharing a story about how she works in Boston, but every time she she's having to go into Boston, she feels a sense of nervousness, and she just feels so much better once she gets across the river and it gets back into Cambridge. Mm. And so it, it was one of those things where everyone else around the table sort of chuckled, like, oh, yeah, I, almost as if they could relate to that experience. Mm -hmm. And I had to pause for a minute and say, hmm, one, because it's actually not the first time that I've heard that comment. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard that comment a couple times before. But two, you know, what is the symbolism that one assumes because they're going into, you know, they're crossing the Charles into another um, city and moving out of Boston that suddenly they're, they're safer? You know, one really has to challenge their perceptions about Boston. And, you know, let's face it, there is racial and prejudicial like uh, you know underpinnings to the, a comment like that uh, and and why so and so it was one of those uh, opportunities I think to really spark a, a conversation um, but I knew that there are folks around the table who would not be comfortable even having the conversation so beyond mm -hmm. just avoidance of contact there's also just the avoidance of discussion and that we really need to create spaces like we're doing right now to have mm -hmm. these discussions yeah and I think that's it's not easy to do, and mm -hmm. I think it's really up to the white folks to to move yep. uh, into black territory. Mm -hmm. I mean, Boston is still very, very segregated. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go out to the suburbs, you go out to Newton, Wayland, mm -hmm. where I'm familiar, Sudbury, you don't see any black folks. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and you come into Boston and it's very segregated in Dorchester, Roxbury, although, it's changing because those some of those neighborhoods are, are getting real expensive. Yeah, uh, but they're gentrifying. The, yeah, uh, but the avoidance of contact is part of what Valerie uh, Batts calls modern racism. Mm -hmm. It's different than the old-fashioned racism of yeah. segregated water fountains and you know legally segregated right. uh, schools. Now things are not legally segregated. But in fact, mm -hmm. the modern racism of the example of avoidance of contact is part of that. Yeah. And uh, it makes me sad. I mean, I led this um, uh, course at my congregation in Sudbury called Facing Race and mm -hmm. talked about the avoidance of contact. And I was trying to say, okay, so how can we change that? So a few people uh, who live in Wayland and Newton uh, said they'd like to go to Dorchester and mm -hmm. so I said fine I'll you know they didn't know where to mm -hmm, go so I mm -hmm. said I'll drive you you know it'll be safe you know mm -hmm. you'll be and I'll introduce you to some people who I know and I was driving down uh, Blue Hill Ave mm -hmm. 
And these folks live in Newton and Wayland, I think, and it's maybe, what, 20 miles, 15 miles? They've lived there 30, 40 years. Yep. They had never been there. Yep. And I was yep. driving down the street and I'm thinking like, oh my God, I was like, wow, mm -hmm. they had never been there. And I just felt this sadness hmm. about how people's lives can be so separate and mm -hmm. segregated and uh, and you know it was actually fairly cool like we went to this uh, smoothie shop on Washington Street that had just yeah. opened up and I know was, you're talking about yeah, yeah it was the best smoothies <laughs> I've ever had and I introduced them to mm -hmm. some people I've worked with uh, at the Codman Square NDC and a woman that was mm -hmm. running uh, a Campfield uh, Tenants Association, mm -hmm. and they were real open. And this is like, wow, it was. But I guess I felt kind of sad that for all these years, yeah. this had never happened. And uh, I'm not sure exactly how to make it happen. I mean, I can pick these people up and say, I'll <laughs> meet you and I'll drive you and you'll be safe and I know people and it's okay, but sure. that's not the way things normally work. Right. And uh, and it right. shouldn't be up to uh, it shouldn't be up to the black folks like you to make mm -hmm. that happen. That's like and to expect mm -hmm. you to go to Newton or expect you to go to. Uh, right. I mean, I held this you, you and I organized this intergenerational conversation mm -hmm. and I specifically held it at Mamlio, the yep. Mass Association of um, Minority Law Enforcement Officers mm -hmm. at um, uh, 61 Columbia Road, and thank you, Larry Ellison, yeah. uh, the former president, <laughs> for giving us the place for free, mm -hmm. and it was warm. Uh, and I particularly held it there because I know, having worked in Boston and a fair amount in the black community, yeah. that we're very turf-oriented here in Boston. And uh, and I don't know if you want mm -hmm. to talk about that, but it's, it's so obvious to me as a white person how... Uh, segregated things are and how mm -hmm. white folks will feel comfortable in some places and black folks will feel comfortable in other places mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be up to the for me you know the people who've been on top for so long people like me the white mm -hmm. folks to uh, ask the black folks who've been on the bottom for so long to come to them right it right. should be the opposite because yeah. no one's going to stop me for driving while white mm -hmm. in Dorchester I don't think I mean yeah. it hasn't happened I've driven there a lot but I know my black friends will get stopped mm -hmm. for driving while black in Brookline or Newton or mm -hmm. in Dorchester too. Yeah, you're uh, you absolutely know. right. I mean, I, I, I know that's happening. I don't know if you have uh, any other thoughts about the intergenerational stuff because um, I know people of my generation uh, are often, I don't know, what are we disappointed about? I think sometimes, uh, this stuff about the super reliance on social media right. and the lack of face-to-face -face contact yeah. uh, often makes me sad. Mm -hmm. I mean, just I mean, I ride the subway almost every day. I was riding it today, and uh, almost everyone now, as opposed to 20 years ago, mm -hmm. is on their cell phone, mm -hmm. and no one's talking to anyone. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm the exception. I'll. <laughs> trying to strike up a conversation with someone and assuming they're not on their cell phone, which occasionally I find someone. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know if you have any thoughts about how that has influenced our ability just to communicate across generations. Yeah, I think the, there, so there's a couple thoughts. Um, I think the technology has off, offered a wealth of new opportunities, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we can communicate with folks in different parts of the of the world now yeah. um, by just uh, by holding our handheld cell phones. And yet at the same time, it's made us very complacent about connecting with people who are closer to us. Um, mm -hmm. and, I've, and I've seen, I mean, even, you know, in my own family, I, one time my sister, you know, called me from upstairs on her cell phone and I said, <laughs> I said, you better come downstairs right now. Like, I am not going to answer this question to you over the phone. I know, my kid does that. She'll text me when she's like, upstairs, we have a small house too. You've been there. <laughs> and I just, that just drives me crazy. But it's so easy for younger people to not have to um, facilitate conversation with each other nowadays. Mm. And to me, that, that also, I think, is, is tragic because... Um, it means mm. that we're learning to connect with each other less and we're relying mm. on 
external environmental uh, influences more. And if we're still living mm. in a racial, you know, society, like there's, there's no, there is no such thing. I will, I would argue with anyone who who claims that the United States is post-racial society. We're not yeah, post-racial ridiculous. society, yeah. uh, but it makes it even harder to have these types of courageous conversations that we need to have mm -hmm. uh, by avoiding contact. And now it's so much easier now to avoid contact as, mm. you know, as, as Valley Brad talks about, is it because of the this influence of technology. And I also think there also is some structural things too, you know, because the culture, mm. culture has shifted so much, it also makes it harder for people to communicate across the generations. You know, mm. um, I hear a lot from um, elders that I talk to who say things like, that's not how we used to do things. Like, things are so different now. Mm -hmm. There are new rules, and I don't know what those rules are, and mm. how does anyone explain these new rules to me? Um, and I think for a lot of young people, it's equally the same way. They're like, well, well, the way you used to do things is not the way it was anymore. There are new ways of things getting done. So how do we sort of meet each other in the middle, right? What are you talking about? What kind of new rules? I'm not I sure think just new mean. methods of communication. There's just sort of new ideologies. There are a lot of new terms that are part of the of millennial lexicon oh, that's like not I'm part of. Oh, her. Yeah, like, you know, cancel culture. Yeah, I was like, or, what is that? Yeah, I was like, But also, yeah. there's also some new things that also have been very progressive as well. Like, there's terms that are, you know, like non-binary. Like, that's not yeah. a term that we used 10 years ago, know, yeah. right? Um, there is uh, a whole set of new, even the word uh, social equity. We never really use social equity the way we use it now. We used to say things like equality, but mm. equity is a much better term to define mm -hmm. what's needed because it's not so much about giving everybody equal share. If we all started off at different places, right. then we need to actually have the appropriate amount to then get to, equi uh, to, get to equality. So in some ways, these new sort of ways of connecting and communicating have been very helpful but not everybody's having the same conversation. So mm -hmm. how do we have that broader conversation together is I think what we have to figure out. Yeah, yeah. I think sometimes it can be helpful. I mean, mm -hmm. I was watching this Robin DiAngelo video today, The Woman That Woke, mm -hmm. and it's short and it's good, and I think that's yeah. great that people can see that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's more helpful to have the face-to-face -face conversations yeah. and people Absolutely. really getting to know each other, and that is not something that can happen on a YouTube on a video, text or, yeah, it and it no can't way. happen in a you know once a year Martin Luther King breakfast. No. Let's all hold hands and sing "We Shall Overcome." Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of my black friends hate singing that mm -hmm. song. You know, it's like we're done with "We Shall." You know, yes, exactly. Uh, and <laughs> and I've only learned that mm -hmm. by uh, over years and years and years by listening. Yes. You know, and to me, it's interesting. Yes. One of the first people, uh, Roger Newell, may mm -hmm. his memory be a blessing, who died, a uh, black man who uh, uh, I worked with at, in the late 80s as mm -hmm. an organizer. And he was very patient. He would, like, explain things. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, it was sort of like anthropology. This is mm -hmm. a different culture. He would explain... Uh, can't remember what selling wolf tickets was. That was like yeah. an expression. And then uh, it was a, he gave me this book by a guy named Kochman, I think, K-O-C-H-M-A-N, called Conflict in Black and White. Mm -hmm. And it was just uh, like Familiar an anthropological that. study. Roger mm -hmm. was a very patient teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, he had gone to Columbia a few years after me, grew up mm -hmm. working class in Washington, D.C., uh, really smart guy, and he was very patient. He would just explain things to me. And I remember uh, he gave me this book to read, and one of the things in the book I'll never forget was he said, uh, or the author, Kochman, I think it was, uh, said two black folks could be talking to each other and yelling and screaming, and they could be like this far away from each other's face. Right. But that didn't mean they were going to hit each other. Right. It just meant that was their culture. <laughs> and in white culture, it meant they maybe were going to hit each other. Absolutely. And where it made a real difference was around policing. Mm -hmm. Like if a police, mm -hmm. a white police officer, two, saw two black people talking and yelling and screaming and you know getting at yeah. each other, he may have you know, go over and hit him yeah. and said, because he assumed the next thing was going to be someone throwing a punch. Yeah, and I've been actually witness to incidences where I've seen police officers pull their revolvers on, you know, 
people of color because they were talking loudly, assuming that they're arguing that they're going to, you know, get into a fight. And, and then everyone would be like, whoa, 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 like you're totally misinterpreting the situation yeah. here. And that <laughs> has real consequences. And yep. to me, it was like, wow, that's really interesting. It's like going to uh, mm -hmm. Borneo and seeing this other culture and like, yep. They do things different, or in France, they do things different. You know, they have little kids are drinking wine, and it's not that <laughs> bad. That's what it is, yeah. or it's a different culture. It's so different I was kind of like, wow, that's great. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would just explain stuff to me, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I didn't know that, and it mm -hmm. was interesting and learning. And Roger was real patient, and I'll never forget one of the things that was really interesting. The uh, leader was this very uh, wealthy waspy woman, mm -hmm. and. In the office, Roger was very quiet. Mm -hmm. And then one day we went for lunch, and all of a sudden we're in Boston. And he goes out and he's like really noisy. And I'm like, woo! <laughs> it was so funny. It was like a different person because he yeah. wasn't constrained by the office culture. Yes. And yeah. I just learned a lot just by, mm -hmm. you know, he was the same person. I mean, mm -hmm. but he was just so different. Uh, and then I went to stay in his house in Washington, <laughs> D.C., mm -hmm. and he was really different there. Mm -hmm. you know, and it was just so interesting to observe that mm -hmm. because he was so affected by the environment he was in. Yes. And I was just an observer. And we, you know, I stayed in his house. We were doing this project in Washington, and I stayed there for a few days. And, uh, and it was just very different to see how he operated. Yeah. And you know, meet his family and his wife and stuff like that. And so I just learned. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not like I'm so smart, uh, although I'm not stupid. But if you stick around, you learn. Yeah. And and some people like Roger of blessed memory really were good teachers and would just patiently explain things. Oh, this is right. what this expression is, and this is here, and uh, right. and that's part of how I've learned a little bit about race and what's different mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. uh, and just having friends who are black who get stopped by the police. Yep. I mean, you know, one of them has a degree from Oxford. Mm -hmm. His aunt is uh, the dean of a uh, graduate school. Right. And they were driving, you know, the, on the New York State Thruway, he tells me the story, you know, observing the speed limit, they get out, they get taken out, you know, mm -hmm. spread eagled, his aunt who's the dean of a graduate school, doesn't matter. Right. And I'm like, whew. You know, I know that's not happening to me when right. I'm driving down the New York State Thruway. Mm -hmm. So I've just learned, and when I know people, it's undeniable. And so those kinds of conversations, I think, are important, but won't happen just over the Internet, won't happen just by YouTube. Right. I mean, maybe that can be one way it can start, and I hope this video can be a little part of it. Yep. But I really encourage white folks like me to... Uh, start hanging out in other places and making friends with people that don't look like me. Right. I and mean, I would just know. add that that engagement needs to be ongoing. You yeah, know? absolutely. It can't be like a, we're going to come into this community and observe and learn and take notes no, no, no. and then leave and never no, come no, back. No, 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 uh, no. Because that just makes, you that's know, like, that turns uh, people into specimen oh, and, and tokenizes them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's disgusting. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, I would feel that way if anyone yeah. did that to me. But it happens to communities oh. of color all the time, yeah. all yeah. the time. And, um, and I think that's a learning that, uh, you know, I've been, I've been involved in academia a lot more mm -hmm. over the last recent years, and it, too often I hear stories of, you know, uh, researchers who want to do projects, and a lot of times they'll approach me and hope that I will sort of, you know, make introductions for them in a community, and I always have to say, no, I'm not comfortable with that. <clears throat> um, and then they get upset and frustrated because in their eyes, they're like, well, we're trying to do something good for you. And, and I'm like, that's a very progressive approach, to th uh, a, a stance to take on it. But at the end of the day, you're getting resources to come in and study us and treat us like we're guinea pigs. For no money. And then, and for no money, and you're, but right. you're asking the community right. to step out and, and teach you constantly but we're not getting any return from that. You know, we're not, our communities are not being uplifted. We're not, you know, getting out of poverty. We're not getting new access into even the universities or the, the academic institutions that you represent. So if there's no, there's not even a, a quid pro quo of, of, of sorts, you know, so there's no equal benefit. It's basically you just, it, this is another form of them harvesting, you know, information or, or harvesting something, resources from 
a community that's already resource strapped. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there needs to be like a, a big, deeper conversation about that. And my hope is going into the future that we really shift the way uh, communities of color, people of color are engaged um, at that level. And I completely agree with you, it needs to start off genuine. It needs to be more of a, hi, my name is so-and-so, let's get to know each other, let's build a, you know, a rapport as mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, I'm coming in to, you know, extract information and, and cause it's, that's just, that's not a genuine place to start from, you know. And one thing I really appreciate about our relationship is, you know, you're an older white Jewish man, I'm a younger, <laughs> younger of sorts. You're a lot younger. <laughs> <laughs> you're younger than my daughter by 10 years. <laughs> yes, you know, I'm, I'm a younger, you know, black you woman. Um, yeah you know, Haitian immigrant background, uh, you know, raised Catholic, and yet we and I can still connect with each other yeah. on an interpersonal level. Uh, we can still be great friends despite our differences because at the end of the day, we, we, we find synergy in our, in our shared humanity and our shared values. Yeah, I mean, and that's what it's about. Yeah, I know? mean, and there's some things, uh, I mean, I think being a Jew has influenced me because mm -hmm. we, uh, as Jews, my family were treated as other than white people. Right. Not so much during my life, but just before I was born. I mean, yep. my father yep. was born in Hungary. My wife's father was yeah. born in uh, uh, Austria and had to escape as a refugee. So we yeah. were definitely treated as less than. I right. mean, you know, put in cattle cars and trucks and sent to be killed. You know, that's yep. definitely kind of being treated as less than. Definitely. Uh, so I definitely got that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also understood growing up that there were lots of differences among us white folks. Mm -hmm. Like the biggest, where I grew up in New York, uh, the biggest differences weren't, there were huge differences between like the Jewish families and the Italian Catholic families. That was mostly who was there. I didn't meet a Protestant, I would say, until I mm -hmm. went to college. Uh, everybody's grandparents talked with an accent, either mm -hmm. Yiddish or Italian, and there were a few mm -hmm. Irish people there. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. But there were huge battles, not so much among us kids in high school, but the parents. Yeah. Oh my God, the parents didn't want, mm -hmm. you know, I had this Catholic girlfriend for a little while and her father hated me mm -hmm. because I wasn't Catholic and wouldn't let me see his daughter. So mm -hmm. I was very aware of the differences among white people. Mm -hmm. And as I've gotten older, I see a lot of white people that don't see their culture or don't think they have a culture. Mm -hmm. I remember I was doing this workshop at the Service Employees Union with my friend Ron, who's black, yep. and he was asking, you know, tell us something mm -hmm. about your culture. And this one white guy said, well, I don't have any culture. Mm -hmm. And Ron was very nice. Mm -hmm. He let him let everyone else go when he came back to him. And finally he realized, oh, he was from Syracuse and had this basketball culture and it was mm -hmm. around the Syracuse University basketball team. There was a culture, He yes. was very proud of and that was a whole culture. It <laughs> yep. wasn't my culture. Yep. I came from a very different culture, yep. but he definitely had a culture and mm -hmm. a lot of white people don't see that. Right. They don't even think they're white. Mm -hmm. They uh, don't think there's any difference. Mm -hmm. uh, I was doing this workshop at uh, my temple, as I mentioned earlier, and one of the guys, classic thing, yeah. uh, he said, I don't see color. And luckily... That statement makes me cringe I, I all know. the time. <laughs> luckily, I was very happy, uh, an Asian woman who mm -hmm. was a former president of our congregation, a woman who's an immigrant from China, right across the room, he, who he knows pretty well, said, mm -hmm. well, then you don't see me. Right. <laughs> and I, he was like, ooh. You know, but I'm so glad he heard it from her. Yes. But if she hadn't been there... Mm -hmm and hadn't challenged that statement, he wouldn't have learned anything. He wouldn't, And no. wouldn't have learned that when I say, mm -hmm. I don't see color means he doesn't see her. Right, that it's and an that's erasure really of identity. really important. Mm -hmm. When she said, you don't see me, and they were mm -hmm. in the same room and known each other for you know a couple decades probably, mm -hmm. but never talked about that. Mm. And so that was, I hope, I hope a real learning opportunity for him. Absolutely, uh, and I, I think that's a, 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 I think it's really important because it's an erasure of identity, and there have been so many different ways in which different populations have had their identity erased over the mm -hmm. over time. You know, um, I did a talk a, a, mm. a couple years ago, and um, and I talked about sort of the history of. Um, the Jewish, uh, the Irish, and the Italian sort of transition into whiteness. Because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people sort of think that's a, like a blanket thing. And I'm like, no, there was a time where 
you know, Italians were not considered white. The Irish were not considered white. And the Jews were not considered right. white. And it was an easy assimilation over time. I mean, it wasn't mm -hmm. easy in, in terms of practice, but it was an assimilation that was possible over time simply because of skin tone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and as more African Americans began to move, particularly in, like during the migration into the North, mm -hmm. uh, it was a lot easier to sort of claim you know, the Irish and the Jews and, and the Italians and say, okay, well, you're one of us now. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we don't want to get, you know, we don't want to connect with them. And that actually helped to fuel a lot of the segregation mm -hmm. and redlining practices that, you know, still affect us today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not sure exactly where we go with this. It's an ongoing conversation. And mm -hmm. uh, across generations, I think it's, um, it's more difficult. I mean, one yeah. of the things I'm trying to do as, uh, as an elder now, I'm past mm -hmm. 70, is work with young people because, and part of the reason I'm doing that is one of the things I wanted when I was in mm -hmm. my 20s was people who were in their 40s and 50s to kind of guide me. And yes. I think it's true, I mean, I and people who've worked mm -hmm. as community organizers for 40 or 50 years, and at this point I have, mm -hmm. have learned a few things. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that we uh, convey that to people. You know, what's happened in the past, what's worked, what hasn't worked. There's, there's quite a bit that we do know. Yep. And uh, not that we're not interested in continuing to learn, I think we are, but having that conversation across generations yeah. is, is real important. Uh, and also, I think for young people to realize, hopefully they'll be older sometime. I mm -hmm. mean, I don't know anyone who says, <laughs> oh, you know, I want to die when I'm 40 or whatever <laughs> the age of being older is. Uh, but there is, uh, for myself, there is age discrimination. I mean, yes, I think I was telling is. you earlier, Absolutely. I was just, I've literally been told you're too old for this job. And I probably know more and am more competent now. Yeah and more able to do training and organizing than I was, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so that makes me both sad and angry because it's sort of stupid. Yep. I mean, I'm pushy enough that I can find places to, to practice what I do, mm -hmm. but that does exist. And it does. for younger people, if they allow that to happen, they're gonna be in my place mm -hmm. in, you know, 20 or 30 years, you know, God willing, you'll yeah. live that long or longer. So. I think we can agree that um, any mm -hmm. kind of ism, ageism, adultism, racism, sexism is work that we need to do to eradicate from, um, from this country and from this uh, collective social mentality that, uh, that mm -hmm. makes up this country. And I think, um, I think you're right when we go, uh, what you mentioned earlier about education is the way to go. I think we need to start building these uh, conversations as part of our learning earlier on, mm. starting um, as, as, as children um, and through, um, throughout our lives because it, uh, these systemic issues and the barriers and the way they play, play out and how we interact or don't interact with each mm -hmm. other, it's all learned, it's all taught. And so we can unlearn those things too. Mm -hmm. And I hope that, I think the key to do it is to for older, uh, the older generation mm -hmm. and the younger generation to come together and do it together, because there's no other way. It can't be either or. Yeah, no, I feel really privileged. I mean, I was lucky. I grew up with my grandmother, mm -hmm. Minnie Jacoby, who was born in the 1890s on the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned a lot about her life, mostly because her husband died when I was 10 and she moved into my room. Mm -hmm. I mean, my dad fixed up another room so I didn't have to listen to her snore mm. uh, in the attic. But she lived with That's us nice. all those years. I was growing up and I heard about her life. She was eight when her mother died and her father was too poor to support her. And her brother went into the Hebrew orphanage and she went to work at eight, mm -hmm. uh, working with a janitor, cleaning out toilets in the Lower East Side and tenement buildings and didn't wow. get to go to school. and. She was smart, but you know she was so poor there was no social security. This was like 1906, mm -hmm. no unemployment, mm -hmm. so her father couldn't if he wasn't he was too poor to get a job. Mm -hmm. uh, no social security when her mother died, so she had nothing, and that was common for lots of people. And I, it was helpful for me just to learn about that. Yeah. Uh, and I learned about it personally across mm -hmm. generations. Yeah. Uh, because she was there when my parents were yeah. at work and I came home from school, there she was, and 
she would tell lots of stories and yep. I heard lots of stories about what her life was like so I feel pretty lucky that mm -hmm. I got that information about what life was like for lots of people yep. way before I was even born yeah and I think I a lot of people way. don't aren't uh, you know I think I was lucky to get that but a lot of people don't have that information you yeah know? I mean I think I was lucky you know um, especially starting out yeah. as an organizer like I sought out a lot of feedback in um, and uh, input and also to learn about the history of organizing particularly from the elders in my community mm. um, and that was really helpful to me to and part of my organizing journey and so I agree I think we all need to learn from each other but I think we're out of time. <laughs> yeah, so I just appreciate this conversation to be continued, you yeah. know, as you said, and I think both of us agree, this is not a one-shot thing. It's an ongoing conversation, and I hope this will continue, and other people, hopefully it will inspire others to have other conversations across generations and across race. Well, so thank, thank you, Michael. Lot. Thank thanks you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> thank you. All right. <laughs> That was great. Yeah, it was chills. It was okay. <laughs> yeah. That was fantastic. <laughs>